Hello, and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today, I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 8, The Pool Guy. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm doing okay. Just feeling feeling real good. I'm a little sore. <laughs> Oh no, here comes gym talk again. I, I, I'm sorry. I know that's really annoying. Like, we get it. You go to the gym. I guess it's because it's just what I'm feeling in my body at the moment. And at my age, I just like feel every discomfort. And, but like soreness, I love. I don't mind feeling soreness. Anyway, I went to the gym this morning. And I'm really sorry. Um, I'll leave it at that. But I will segue this into a complaint. And I feel like it's a very (laughs) Seinfeldian slash Larry David complaint. But in the locker room at my gym, I opt for the farthest corner bay of lockers. And that is also apparently where all the, how shall I put this very sensitively the old ass ladies go. So it's all the ladies who do like the aquatic, you know, like the uh, water aerobics, all those types of classes, which is great. I hope to be one of these ladies one day. They roll in literally with their roller bags. They don't have, you know, duffels or backpacks. They're rolling in, I think, and they think they pack for like four days when they come to the gym because they don't have any reservation to just spread out all their crap. (laughs) I mean, it doesn't matter if other people are there. They need that entire bench to lay out Every single piece of clothing they've brought, uh, their lotions, the 14 towels that they apparently need. But my complaint, speaking of towels, my complaint, which happens 100% of the time uh, I'm there, (laughs) I go to the gym. I don't know what these ladies have against not dripping all over the floor, whether they're coming in from the pool or they're coming back from showering. There are just puddles of water all over the tile floor, which I'm sure many of you have guessed would make the floor extremely slippery. (laughs) And so I'm getting to the point now where I'm going to say something. And it's I don't know if it's like the Indian in me respecting my elders and you don't talk back or whatever it is. But like I, I have reservations to kind of you know, sternly tell these ladies, hey, can we maybe put a towel on the floor or at least wipe it up when you drip what seems like four gallons of water off your body onto the tile floor? I I really want to say something. And to be fair, they're not nice to me. I, I always seem like I'm bothering them, you know, just going to my locker, which I have the right to go to. But if I have to kind of squeeze past them, they make no room. They don't acknowledge me, even though I always say good morning or hello. Nope, I barely get a nod. Uh, They're in their own conversations and they just don't have any time for a young whippersnapper like me, which of course I'm not a young whippersnapper, but compared to them, I am. Uh, But anyway... (laughs) Sorry, I guess I really needed to get this off my chest. And thank you guys for listening to this. But today was like the worst of all. There was four of them not getting out of my way. And I actually showered at the gym today. Usually I don't. And a lot of the reason I don't is because these ladies just don't give an inch. And they're like, we own this whole bay of lockers. I don't know what you think you're doing here, lady. But today I I wanted to shower there. I wanted to just get all my stuff done. And I would prefer to shower there most of the time. But ugh, these bully old ladies. <laughs> um, But anyway, uh, another woman, not me, slipped in their puddle and said something like, and she's their age. She's not my age. She's their age. And she's like, oh, my goodness. Oh, that's dangerous. Someone's going to fall one of these days. And these fucking bitches say nothing. They just ignore her, even though they know they're the problem. And the irony of all ironies is that these ladies... I would imagine their bones are on the more brittle side. I would imagine they're taking Boniva. And the only reason I know what Boniva is is because my elderly mother has to take it for osteoporosis. Or she used to take it. I know she's going to correct me. But anyway, (laughs) the irony being that if you guys slipped in your own puddle of water, 
you're breaking a hip. I mean, that's 100% guaranteed. And yet you just feel the need to not wipe anything up and just leave your mess behind. Oh my goodness. Um, obviously, some this is something <laughs> that's really getting under my skin. And it's such a first world problem. And there are eight billion things in the world, especially right now, that are way more pressing than this. But I just want, I just needed to vent. And I appreciate you guys listening to my very first world obnoxious problem that's really not even a problem. Um, <laughs> it's just something that today, especially when a person of their age group pointed out to them, hey, this is dangerous. One of us is going to fall and absolutely shatter bones in our frail old bodies. I guess you could say maybe they didn't hear her. But no, they all chat together. They hear each other just fine. They chose to ignore her completely. And she just accepted their non-response to what she said. And everyone just moved on. Um, (laughs) I mean, it's just one of those things where it's so inconsiderate. But anyway, we are coming off another mass shooting in this country The war in the Middle East is so horrific. Like, I can't, my heart can't take it. I I, obviously, there are way more important things in this world than my stupid (laughs) complaint about these old ladies and the puddles of water they leave behind. But you know what? Sometimes we just have to vent, and that's all I'm doing. But let's get into this episode so that I can maybe help distract you from the shit show and horror show of the world today. All right, the synopsis for The Pool Guy is as follows. An annoying pool guy at the health club insists on being Jerry's friend. A burgeoning friendship between Elaine and Susan makes George fear that his worlds are colliding. Kramer begins giving out movie showtime information after realizing his new phone number is only one digit from 777 Film. This episode was written by Dave Mandel. Totally not necessary to point out, but I don't know why the synopsis has to say 777 film, which is the actual number apparently, or used to be. I'm sure it does not exist anymore. But um, obviously in the show, it's 555 film. (sighs) All right. First, we're in Jerry's apartment. George asks him, who do you think would uh, win in a fight between the two of us? Like a really serious fight. Well, Jerry thinks that's pretty obvious. Yeah, George thinks so too. Elaine enters and Jerry asks her who would win between he and gorgeous George here. You mean a real fight fight? She asks. And she says, George. Jerry wonders why George? Because George fights dirty. Oh yeah, what would you do? Pull hair, poke eyes, groin stuff, whatever it takes. Elaine turns to Jerry, very excited, asks if he wants to join her at the historical clothing exhibit at the Met. I'm sorry, he says. She turns to George. What, I want to see what Mary Todd wore to Lincoln's funeral? Ugh, Elaine says there's nobody she can go with. Kramer enters, and Elaine realizes, you know, I don't have one female friend left. And Kramer says, of course, you're a man's woman. You hate other women, and they hate you. Thank you, she says sarcastically. <laughs> Kramer and Jerry talk about their movie plans later, and George is wondering about something if Susan... He's about to call her, but then decides, nope, I better get going, and exits. There's nothing more pathetic than a grown man who's afraid of a woman, Kramer says. And Jerry suggests Susan to Elaine. George is Susan? Of course, she says. She should be friends with Susan. (laughs) Yes, Susan. She's so relieved and Elaine exits. Kramer tells Jerry that's going to be trouble. Why? Don't you see? This is George's sanctuary, this world. Now, if Susan comes in contact with this world, his worlds collide. You know what happens then. Then we get a classic Kramer impression here. (laughs) A big explosion and he gets sandwich everywhere. All right, my take on the scene. This is a very funny opening scene. We start with one of those classic Seinfeld conversational exchanges. This is what we love about this show. It has nothing to do with the bigger picture of the episode, but it's just We just happen to be catching what these friends are talking about in the moment. You know, there's nothing more to this. And that's what we love about Seinfeld. Like they have these conversations that are so like kind of out of nowhere, but relatable in a certain way. Elaine choosing George to win the fight and without hesitation is so funny. This relationship, which is the best on the show, which our Greg of Greg Sack Lunch calls Benestanza, (laughs) is just so solid. And it's really not a compliment in a way that 
Elaine is saying that he would win because he's a dirty fighter. <laughs> but the fact that he agrees this is why he would win, it just works. It's so funny. The ease of that comfort is really fun to watch. The moment Elaine realizes that Susan should have been such an obvious choice is sort of the moment I think the audience realizes that. The show has done such a good job of keeping that relationship so separate that it didn't even occur to us as the audience that Elaine and Susan should probably be friends. And I love, I love JLD's performance with that realization. That little slap on her head is great. Like, duh, of course, Susan. It's wonderful. All right, next we're at the movie theater. Kramer tells Jerry how he's going to have to change his phone number because of uh, chicks, man. Too many chicks have my number. A man comes over and greets Jerry as Mr. Backstroke, and then Jerry introduces him to Kramer as Ramon from the new health club he joined. And Ramon tells him how he got fired from the club. Yeah, they said I put too much chlorine in the pool. Anyway, he says, stay out of the deep end and walks away. Kramer wonders, what's in the deep end? All right, next we're in George's apartment. Elaine calls, and George is pretty happy to hear from her. Hey, lady! And she asks to speak to Susan. And it's so out of the blue that George thinks she's joking. <laughs> yeah, sure, I'll get it for you. <laughs> Seriously, what's up? No, really, Elaine says she would like to speak to Susan. Why? Because I want to ask her to lunch and the Met tomorrow. Oh, no, you don't want to do that. Well, why not? What would be the point of that? Look, are you going to put her on the phone or not? Where did this come from all of a sudden? He's getting so upset. And she is too. Are you going to let me talk to Susan or not? I really think I should have been consulted about this, he says. He hands the phone over to Susan. Hello? <laughs> that wasn't a great Susan, but that's how she says it. And George kind of stands by nervous and we hear Susan say, oh, I'd love that. She loves that kind of stuff. George takes off his glasses in defeat and distress. Um, I take in this scene. I sort of love how happy <laughs> George is to hear from Elaine. <laughs> Again, my sappiness comes out. I, I don't know what it is with this rewatch, but I'm always like, oh, I love when these little moments of their friendship come out and they're like genuinely happy with each other. So he's like, hey, lady, like it's cute. And then Elaine and George, I mean, they get so irritated with each other so quickly. It's like zero to 100 within two sentences. And I love it. It's just like, especially Elaine, she's just like, are you gonna let me talk to her or not? And he's just like, I really think I should have been consulted about this. Uh, it's so wonderful. Like they're on, on par with each other when it comes to just how fast they get irritated with each other. All right, next we're at the theater. Jerry and Kramer find their seats and Jerry wants a buffer seat in between. I mean, hey, if they were on his couch at home, would they sit right next to each other? <laughs> and Kramer agrees, you got a point. Jerry spots Ramon approaching and leans over to Kramer and says, pretend we're talking. We are talking. Pretend it's interesting. Well, it doesn't work. Ramon squeezes in into their buffer seat <laughs> and for whatever reason has a weird accent. Actually, I'll get into that in a little bit, but um, I don't know if any of you noticed, but he's just like, hey, I took a lot of napkins there. You want, you want some? Like, it's like, <laughs> it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is complaining to George how Ramon tagged along with them for the rest of the night. I mean, even after the movie. Finally, he told him, Ramon, I've got to go to bed now. And George asks Jerry if he's spoken to Elaine and tells him that she called Susan last night. Jerry knows because he's the one who suggested it. Well, what did you do that for? She was looking for someone to go to the show with. Well, that was a really stupid thing, he says. Don't you realize what's going to happen now? Jerry says worlds collide. Well, yeah. <laughs> and Jerry goes on because this world is your sanctuary. And if she enters this world, George finishes it. Yeah, it blows up. Yes. So if you knew that, why did you do this? He says he didn't know. Kramer explained it to him. You couldn't figure out the world's theory by yourself. Everyone knows you have to keep your worlds apart. Hey, I guess I slipped up, Jerry says. Kramer enters and <laughs> George points at him. He knows the world's theory. What is it blowing up? George exits. Kramer gets a phone call. It's another wrong number. And then Jerry figures out that his new number is just a digit away from movie phone. And that's why he's getting all these wrong numbers. Your filk. Oh, mama. 
All right, next we're on the street. Elaine and Susan are walking down the street talking about what they saw at the exhibit, especially what Susan B. Anthony wore. Quite the décolletage for a suffragette. It must have been one hell of a party. Woo! Oh, Susan remembers what she wanted to tell Elaine. What? Elaine asks. Eh, I don't know. Susan hesitates. Elaine says, oh, no, you can tell me. I'll put it in the vault. The vault? My take on this scene, this is our first time seeing Elaine and Susan together. Like, it blows my mind (laughs) that we haven't seen them together in a scene by themselves. And I really enjoy seeing them bond here. I mean, it's a short scene, but we see them getting along. And it ends with Susan on the verge of revealing something private to Elaine. So they're really getting along. Now, while I would have loved more Susan and Elaine content, I think this scene does a great job of showcasing how this was a friendship that could really work. Like, I mean, (laughs) they're totally getting, I love, I love that we just get this taste of it. Now I'll get more into my um, scene swap ideas later. (laughs) As you can imagine, I, no spoilers here, but I, pretty sure if you've listened to this podcast, (laughs) you won't be surprised how I might want a little bit more of this. But anyway, I think this scene is really well done. And like I said, it's just a taste. It's not super expositional. They're just showing, hey, these women like each other. All right, next we're in the health club locker room. A couple of employees greet Jerry and they said, we heard you went to the movies with Ramon. Jerry clarifies, well, I didn't go with him. We just bumped into him there. And they're glad that Ramon has friends like Jerry to cheer him up. Tell him to call us. Tell him Dustin says hello. All right, I got to go, Jerry says. To see Ramon? (laughs) Now, just a side note, I took a screenshot and I'll post it to the Hot and Heavy Instagram. But the moment when the one employee says, to see Ramon? And he's like smiling. (laughs) And then Dustin's kind of like laughing with his tongue out. That shot. And they kind of linger on it for like a second and a half longer than probably it needs to be lingered on. But it's so funny to me. The to say Ramon, like my brother and I used to say this to each other all the time. It doesn't matter what context. It would just could have been out of the blue. We're just like sitting on the couch and all of a sudden we'd be like, to say Ramon. Um, it just cracked us up. And it's a really funny moment to this day. I still laugh out loud every time I every time I see it. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry's talking to Elaine, asked what else she and Susan did. Elaine says, oh, just, you know, girly stuff. So flower shows, shopping for pretty bows, and then back to her place, stripped down to brown panties for a tickle fight. Elaine just stares blankly at him for a few beats. That's really what you think girls do, isn't it? Yes, I do, he says seriously. Elaine exhales, all righty, and heads to the bathroom. Jerry tells her, you know, George really isn't too crazy about your new friendship. Yeah, well, I don't really give a shit. And she closes the door (laughs) to the bathroom. Kramer enters. He answers the phone in his pocket and looks up a movie time for the caller. Cupid's rifle, to be exact. He gets off the phone and Jerry's like, you're looking up movie times for people. He's like, I got time. And then immediately gets another call. And he says, no, 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 I'll help. Firestorm's good. I saw it last night. And he tries to get Jerry to talk to this random caller. Jerry's like, no, I don't want want to talk to them. Come on, what's the matter with you? Stop it. (laughs) Kramer gets back on the phone and apologizes and exits. Ramon buzzes and Jerry is so annoyed. What is he doing here? Elaine asks, who's Ramon? The pool guy. What pool guy? And Jerry asks her, listen, just stick around when he comes up. And she's like, yeah, no problem. Ramon enters. Hey, how are you, crazy guy? Jerry introduces Ramon. This is Elaine. And she finishes. And I was just leaving. She says, hi, Jerry, with a big smile on her face before she shuts the door. (laughs) Jerry is trying to get rid of him, saying, you know, he's got stuff to do. He's going out. And Ramon is cool with doing stuff. All right. My take on this scene. In this scene, we have a trifecta, if you will, of Elaine brilliance. First, Elaine's blank stare at Jerry after his girly stuff description. First of all, it's, of course, so hilarious, but so relatable. Am I right, ladies? We have all been, I think, in these situations with men where they either do something like this, harmless, idiotic comments, you know, just joking around. Or I know in meetings at the workplace, you're in a conference room, 
there's like mansplaining or some inane conversation going on about something they shouldn't really be talking about or have no expertise in. And the only thing we can do is just stare blankly. There's no words, only a look. I mean, we already know that JLD is a masterful face actor, but that that moment, that blank stare <laughs> is the blank stare heard round the world by all the women. I can say that confidently. Second in the trifecta is her <laughs> shutting the door as she's saying she really doesn't give a shit. Hilarious. And why would she give a shit? George is being so ridiculous <laughs> and she doesn't have any female friends left. Come on, George, be reasonable. And third is getting the book out when Ramon arrives and <laughs> smiling at Jerry as she does it. Uh, the Elaine escapes, I'm going to call them from now on. I don't know if we get any more, but we saw the first one when George is trying to confront Jerry about Schmoopy and the soup Nazi. She gets the hell out of Dodge there as well. <laughs> and in this episode, I like to think that she made that call. Like, I don't think she intended to do that when she tells Jerry, yeah, no problem. I'll stick around. But as soon as she laid eyes on Ramon, she's like, yeah, I'm not sticking around for this. <laughs> Maybe it was the, hey, crazy guy. Like, she's like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> I can't stand this guy already. <laughs> Bye-bye, Jerry. Oh, it's so good. Anyway, there's a rule of three in comedy and JLD hit them all perfectly. All right, next we're on the subway. Ugh, Ramon is telling Jerry some story about a clogged drain, and Jerry is just so bored. The train stops, and Jerry's like, all right, I'm going to get going. And Ramon tries to follow him, and he, he stops him, and he's like, you know, I think we should just part ways here. What are you trying to say, Jerry? Jerry explains, look, it's nothing personal. I just don't have any room in my life for more friends. I just have three friends. <laughs> oh, it's because I'm a pool guy, isn't it? That has nothing to do with it, Jerry says. The door closes, and as the train pulls away, Ramon is sort of giving this, like, threatening look to Jerry, pointing at his neck. All right, next we're in George's apartment. Susan tells George how she and Elaine got along really well. And he says, you know, it's kind of strange that Elaine has no female friends, kind of as a warning. Susan said they talked all about that. Elaine opened up her vault. George is appalled that Susan said vault. You got that from Elaine, didn't you? Yeah. So what? Well, you're going to start talking like Elaine from now on? I don't know. Anyway, I thought we could all go to a movie on Friday. We'd all go to a movie on Friday? <laughs> oh, God. This is not good, George says. Worlds are colliding. George is getting upset. Gonna bring back the Jimmy. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. George is giving this passionate monologue to Jerry about the magnitude of this situation. A George divided against itself cannot stand, which is a line from Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so brilliant. I, you know, this is an Elaine Bettis podcast, so I don't want to get too much into that. But holy shit, it's brilliant. And actually, in the commentary for this episode, Dave Mandel credits Jerry and Larry for this monologue that George gives about, you know, the world's colliding and George's being divided. And he's like, this is all this is all them. I cannot take credit for this. It's absolutely brilliant. So I thought that was first of all, I thought that was pretty uh, generous of him to do that. And also, of course, Jerry and Larry, just fucking brilliant. Elaine enters and <laughs> George yells at her as soon as she enters. You're killing independent George. You know that, don't you? Uh, she doesn't want to get into it. He tells them that Susan used the word vault. Elaine's like, well, I didn't tell her to say it. And George wonders why she can't find her own girl. What, she's the only girl in the world? I like her, Elaine says. You see? George starts to exit and tells them on the way out, it's all just slipping away. And you're letting it happen. And he exits. Jerry and Elaine move on pretty quickly and decide to go see a movie. <laughs> oh, but he doesn't have a paper. So Elaine calls the movie phone line and gets Kramer. Kramer does an ad, <laughs> I put in quotes, for Mountain High, starring Kevin Bacon and Susan Sarandon. <laughs> of course, Elaine, throughout this pretty long trailer, I guess you could say, recognizes his voice. Kramer? He says, Elaine? What time does Chow Fun start? I don't know. My take on this scene, not much to the Elaine part here. She's just taking George's rant about Susan. The shift after George's dramatic exit is great. They both, like, don't give a shit at all. <laughs> I really don't give a shit. That couldn't be more obvious here with how 
with how quickly they shift their energy after this super dramatic monologue and exit from George, which, again, Jason Alexander, such a genius in this scene. Great face acting here while Elaine is listening to Kramer and his movie phone performance. <laughs> the thing that gets me and makes me, I cannot help but laugh out loud, is when he does that scream. <laughs> it's like so crazy. And Elaine's just like, what? <laughs> oh, it gets me every time. And here in Colorado, as you can imagine, a lot of businesses here are named after mountains. If there's mountain in the name or specifically Rockies or whatever, but there is a mountain high appliance and uh, Seinfeld nerds that we are, my husband and I, when we first moved here and first saw the commercial for mountain high appliance, we, we were so excited. We're like, Mountain High. And we did actually make a purchase from there when we had to get a fridge for our basement. We were very excited. And we made the joke when we went there. Like, I wonder if Susan Sarandon and Kevin Bacon are going to be here. And we laughed to ourselves and no one else got it. All right. Next, we're at the health club. Well, well, we hear a Ramon approach Jerry at his locker. Well, Jerry's like, what are you doing here? You're going to get in trouble. No, I don't think so, Jerry. They gave me my job back. I'm a pool boy. Again. And Jerry apologizes for the other day. He gets a little crabby on the subway. Oh, do you, Ramon says. And Jerry asks, you know, where are all the towels? Oh, I guess they must have disappeared. And Ramon walks away. <laughs> so clearly, Ramon's got a chip on his shoulder. Newman runs up with a stack of towels. He's so excited. He really hit the jackpot. All right, next we're on the street. Jerry is telling Elaine the frustrating situation at the club with all the towel drama. <laughs> she asks if he wants to join her and Susan at the coffee shop for lunch. Uh-oh, Jerry is meeting George at the coffee shop. Oh, Elaine says with a big smile on her face. This should be very interesting. My take on this scene, not much here, just moving the story along. Elaine's delight at the impending drama that's going to take place at the coffee shop is so perfect and so on character. And I can't blame her. George is being an idiot. All right, next we're at Monk's. Jerry and Elaine enter and find Susan at a booth with Kramer. Elaine sits down and Jerry sort of hesitates. Kramer wonders why. He says, well, I'm meeting someone. Uh, you know, I'll wait outside. And Kramer tells him to wait for them here. What's the matter with you? <laughs> so Jerry sits down and says, this is going to be ugly. What's that, Jerry? Susan asks. <coughs> Boy, am I ugly. George enters and, well, takes in the scene. Counts them all. One, two, three, four. <laughs> I hope I didn't blow out my mic doing that, but I had to do it. George storms out with everyone yelling after him. Come on, we'll pull up a chair. There's a quick shot of George eating at Reggie's, which is apparently an old shot. I think it's from the episode where he dates the waitress, and that was called out in the commentary as well. All right, we're back at the health club, and Jerry is swimming laps. Ramon is getting in his way with a pool skimmer, like jabbing him. <laughs> and finally, Jerry's had enough and he grabs it and he ends up pulling Ramon into the pool. Just then, Newman runs and does a huge cannonball, knocking Ramon out. And we cut to Ramon passed out and Jerry and Newman both declining to give him mouth to mouth. He might die, they both agree. All right, next we're at George's apartment. Elaine gets off the phone with Jerry about their movie plans to see Chunnel at 9 p.m. and tells Susan, come on, we can't wait any longer. Susan's concerned. You know, it's not like George not to come home. Elaine's like, look, we'll just leave him a note. I don't know. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Elaine writes the note. Elaine and I went to see Chunnel with Jerry. Love? Yeah. <laughs> Love, Susan. My take on this scene I love that Elaine writes the note. It's very cute and asking, love? It's it's pretty funny. You know, I feel like in this scene, we're seeing that Elaine is that friend who won't let another friend get down about a guy. And I love that about her. All right, next we're at the movie theater. Jerry is telling Elaine and Susan about what happened with Ramon, that somebody eventually came and gave him mouth to mouth. He could have died. Yeah, it was a gamble. Susan asks, why didn't you give him mouth to mouth? Jerry just makes this grossed out face like, ugh. How can you ever show your face there again? Elaine asks. Oh, he can't. They revoked my membership. Same with Newman. We can't go anywhere near there. They get to the ticket booth and Elaine orders three tickets for Chunnel. 
two adults and looks at Jerry, one child. My take on this scene. Now, of course, spoiler alert, (laughs) Susan loses interest in this friendship pretty quickly after this movie. But if the relationship would have survived this movie outing, we can sort of see here in this scene a future Elaine and Susan friendship. Like Elaine would have had an ally in Susan. Like here, they're both calling out Jerry for how awful a person he is. Like he's so grossed out at the notion of giving mouth to mouth that he would let a man die. Like (laughs) that's just... That's just the crux of Jerry, really. And so I like that they're both on the same team here. And I think, again, given uh, what happens, we're never going to see that. But like if if this relationship would have survived, Elaine would have had an ally for sure. All right. Next, we're in George's apartment. George finds the note and is, of course, very upset by it with Jerry. Huh? Jerry probably went to the 84th Street. That's where I always go with Jerry. So he calls movie phone, gets Kramer. I love how both Elaine and George just happen to fat finger this phone number. Kramer is really into this now. He's going through all the normal steps and George is following along. But of course, there's no way for Kramer to understand the keypad tones on your touch tone keypad. So he just keeps asking him, why don't you just tell me where and when you want to see the movie? (laughs) Finally, he tells him that Chunnel is playing at the 84th Street Cinema at 930. George hangs up and rushes out the door. Now I got him. Kramer continues also to say that it's also playing at Theater 2 at 9 o'clock. All right, next we're at the theater. George is inside the theater looking for Elaine, Jerry, and Susan, calling out their names and getting shushed. And then we cut to Jerry, Elaine, and Susan in the correct theater. Jerry is asking all these questions. He just isn't following the plot. And Elaine is trying to explain, totally bothering Susan, would you two please... And they both look at each other like, okay. We go back to George and he's at the front of the theater now yelling at full volume, telling the three to show themselves and that they're lying and laughing. People are not happy, as you can imagine. Finally, a guy tells him that Chunnel is playing in two theaters, that there was a nine o'clock show as well. George kind of relents and says, oh, sorry, and gets buckets of popcorn thrown at him. <laughs> Jerry, Elaine, and Susan are now exiting the theater. Jerry asks Susan how she liked the movie. Oh, I don't know. You two talk the whole time. Ah, come on, Elaine says and asks if she wants to get a bite to eat. No, I don't think so. Why not? Well, you know, all you guys ever do is sit around the coffee shop talking, sit around Jerry's apartment talking. Frankly, I don't know how you can stand it. I'll see ya. And then we see George being dragged out by security. He's yelling about the lion and the laughing and how they're killing independent George. Worlds are colliding. There's also a tag to the episode where the actual movie phone guy knocks on Kramer's door in full movie phone voice, telling him how he's mad that he's stealing his business and threatening him. Uh, My take on that ending scene, it's just perfect. I love that Susan... She got a taste of what it's like to be in this group, and it doesn't take long. (laughs) It takes a day and a half, maybe, for her to make the decision she wants out of this world. Don't worry about the worlds colliding, George. She wants out of it. (laughs) I love, love, love this. I think it's so true to life when, especially in relationships, when someone new comes along into like a core group of friends, it's always tricky. And I mean, now at my age and kind of being a part of relationships and having to make friends in different circles, like it's kind of rare to find like couples that all get along and all like each other. I mean, it's it's a really tough situation when there's just one or two people that everyone's like, oh, God, well, they have to come along because they're with so and so and all this stuff. But (laughs) this where Susan's like, yeah. I'm not into this at all, (laughs) because I think we would just assume, oh, Susan would love to be more a part of George's life. No, Susan, I think, is a little too good for this group. And I have to say, I'm totally on Susan's side with the whole talking in the movie thing. Holy shit. It's, It's one of my biggest pet peeves. I had a friend in college who... It was the year that Titanic came out, and then around that time... When did Aaron Brockovich... Was it around the same? Anyway, for whatever reason, I I saw, I happened to see Titanic in the theater with this friend and later Aaron Brockovich with this friend. And she acted as if we were sitting in a room with no one else around 
and talking full volume. And especially with Titanic, it was pissing me off because listen, I mean, I was all in. I was, I mean, I think I saw it in the theater four times and I think I cried every single time. Like I was, it, it that movie got me. That movie fully, fully got me. I just loved it. But when I saw it with her, she uh, <laughs> didn't really get seduced by the romance of it at all. She kept laughing. Like she was laughing during the like, sinking part when like the families are scared and people are falling over the side she's fully laughing like it's a Jim Carrey comedy I'm like what the fuck like shut up and then an Aaron Brockovich I remember like her (laughs) the part where Julia Roberts as Aaron Brockovich kind of goes off on that boyfriend after he tells her like look I I'm not here just to be your babysitter. Like, I'm here to be with you. And anyway, he's breaking up with her because it's just too much. She's never home because she's always working on the case. Anyway, um, she says something. I can't remember the line, but she says something to him, kind of insulting him. And this friend, like, looks up in full volume, mind you. is like, that's not cool. He's been taking care of our kids. That is not cool at all. Aaron Brockovich, no. Like, it was like, and people are turning around. I'm like, oh, my God. Anyway, this is all to say, and again, more venting. This is just like my venting episode. (laughs) I'm totally on Susan's side. And I should have said to this friend, would you please? And give her a look. And then also, Elaine and Jerry's reaction after she says that to him, just like, okay, so insulted. And just another shout out to Heidi Swedberg with that delivery of, frankly, I don't know how you can stand it. (laughs) It's so, oh my God, it's so good, so brilliant. And I still stand by just making a case for Heidi Swedberg because she deserves it. She's such a fantastic part of the Seinfeld series. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. They say what's old is new again. And that is so true, except most of the time they're talking about like 25 years ago. I mean, I loved the 90s too, the 1890s. Hey there, I'm Kara Groin, founder of Groin Stuff, the fashion house that celebrates historical clothing. I have such a respect for the fashion of yesteryear, olden times, bygone eras, whatever you want to call it. And when I think about how all the iconic fashion trends of today would not be possible without those historical eras, it like blows my mind. When you wear groin stuff, the history of fashion or fashstery, trademark pending, will course through your body. Our signature is our pinafore dress. Its rectangular shape will have you asking, am I literally in Northern Europe during the migration period right now? Our variety of petticoats are addictive, trust me. You can't buy just one. And we're so excited. In spring of 2024, we will be offering the Balmoral Petticoat in our 1860s active wear collection. Move over, Lululemon leggings. From bodices to breeches, you will be sure to stand out in your groin stuff ensemble. You can shop for groin stuff at joinmygroin.corset today. From now until the end of the year, you will receive a free neckerchief weaved in the jacquard style using a genuine Dobby loom from the 1800s. Uh, yeah, I'm not joking. Groin stuff. Susan B. Anthony would totally love us. And we're back. So in the extras for this episode, in the inside look, the writer David Mandel talks about Danny Hawk. And so I wanted to get into this story. Danny Hawk was the uh, actor, I guess you could say, but he, he goes by many different titles, like artist, street performer, but also an actor. He was hired originally to play Ramon. Now, the deal with him was that they had seen his one man show where he does he's a, he's a white man, but he does 
multiple Latino characters, all these different Latino voices, amongst other things too, like other accents. But predominantly, it was like a lot of Latino characters this man did in his act. So they wanted to hire him to play Ramon. They were really impressed. But when it came time for him to do the accent, he refused. He said, no, I think it's degrading. And there are plenty of Latino actors out there who could play this role without having to do a fake accent. And it's just beneath me. I don't want to do it. And so it got pretty heated. (laughs) Jerry and Larry were like, but this is what we hired you to do. And he was like, no, I refuse. I'm just gonna, I'll do a Russian accent. He offered up a Russian accent, but they tried it. It just didn't really work. And so he ultimately got fired. And then he went on (laughs) to do a one-man show. Like five months later, the producers and writers of Seinfeld heard about this one-man show that Danny Hawk was doing that told this story. And so they incorporated that whole idea with the Kathy Griffin storyline later down the road where she does her one-woman show, (laughs) Jerry Seinfeld is the devil. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that. It's it's interesting because I think Danny Hawk had this maybe maybe he went in the future and saw the world we're living in now where first of all representation matters. Why is a white guy doing this Latino accent? Like it's just not appropriate and it is insulting. So I I completely commend him for standing up for himself. I don't think that could have been easy. I mean, as a, I'm sorry, but kind of a nobody in this setting, the number one show on television with powerful guys like Jerry and Larry, and you're standing up to them saying like, you know, this feels wrong. This feels like we're punching down. <laughs> it was a different time. I hope they wouldn't do this today, but they were sort of like forcing him like, no, we need you to do this accent. And Apparently, too, he mentions in his show about about his experience that both Jason Alexander and uh, Julie Louis-Dreyfus were really supportive of him. They they were like, hey, you know, stick to your beliefs and we get it and we we understand why you're doing what you're doing. While Michael Richards, it wasn't so much a shut up and do your job, but he was just like, man, you're going to lose this job if you just don't just go along with what they want. He was, I think, looking out for the guy going like, this is a big opportunity. I think it's worth just doing this accent so that you can stay on the show. Otherwise, you're going to lose your job. They're going to fire you. So I think in in different ways, Michael Richards was looking out for the guy. And so was Jason Alexander and JLD. So they were all kind of looking out for him for different ways. But of course, Michael Richards more just like, hey, just suck it up and do it. Jason Alexander and JLD are like, we get it. Stick to your convictions. Now, in the commentary, David Mandel, they talk about the story again and He talks about how the Latino accent written into the script, that it wasn't meant to be demeaning, but it was just meant to display, again, to further differentiate Jerry and this Ramon character. So the whole premise of this this plot is that this guy just gloms onto Jerry for whatever reason. They have nothing in common. Jerry just is not, he's just kind of annoying to Jerry. And the accent was just, oh, well, this is, they're even more different because they're from different backgrounds. Now, I mean, I can argue, well, that really isn't necessary (laughs) because now they brought in this other actor who doesn't do the accent at all, except that weird part. Like I'm telling you guys in the movie theater, it's very quick, but he's like, I got a lot of napkins. Eh." Like he says it in this like Latino accent. So I'm like, what is that about? Or if he's just maybe, maybe he's just trying to be weird. I don't know. Anyway, um, so ultimately the Latino accent doesn't even come into play, but I just thought this was an interesting story about this this guy, Danny Hawk. And like I said, I give him credit for sticking to his beliefs. And I mean, ultimately, I think he made the right decision and tried to, of course, capitalize on it with his one man show. But um, yeah, good for him, because look, at that time, not many people were thinking about, hey, this is insulting to an entire culture or community. And well, and if you do want someone to have this accent, why don't you just hire someone from that community, not some white dude who does the voice. And so, yeah, good, good for him. I also do believe that Dave Mandel wasn't trying to insult anyone, but just like he said, I was just trying to further differentiate the characters. So I don't think anyone had any malicious intent. Anyway, thanks for an interesting story behind the scenes of this episode. In the commentary as well, they <laughs> so they did a lot of recording. You can only hear bits and pieces of it, but they did all this recording. You could probably recognize Larry David's voice in the in the movie channel. 
So they did all this stuff and they actually did write this like dialogue for the movie. For those of you who may be wondering, the plot of Chunnel was that the president's daughter was trapped and being held hostage in the Chunnel. So I just thought that was funny. And then in the notes about nothing, there were some deleted dialogue that I wanted to mention. Jerry suggests other ladies. So when Elaine in the beginning is like, there's no one I can go with to this historical clothing exhibit. Jerry suggests other ladies from Elaine's work and says, what's her name with the boots? Elaine responds, ah, she's too tall. We look funny together. Elaine then nixes two other co-workers, Dana, who has little knickknacks and creatures on her desk, and Coley, which is short for Nicole. So I think the thing is there, like, who goes by Coley? And I thought this was interesting. In more deleted dialogue, it was revealed that Elaine thought Susan B. Anthony had quite the rack. And Susan was to say to George the same thing in the scene where she uses the word vault. She was supposed to start that scene with saying how Susan B. Anthony had quite the ample bosom. So apparently both these ladies, you know, she's mentioned in that little scene, quite the decolletage for a suffragette. But apparently they couldn't get Susan B. Anthony's rack off of their minds. All right, now it's time to open Greg's sack lunch. Greg is our most dedicated contributor, and every week he sends us his sack of thoughts. First are his overall thoughts. He says, This is one of the episodes I forget exists for some reason, and watching it back, I liked it more than I remember. I think it's because on this current look back episode by episode, I really appreciate the Susan character so much more. Watching this when it originally aired as a teenager, she seemed like such a killjoy to me, but in reality, she was the perfect character to be paired with George. She's never really wrong or mean or anything. In fact, she's more normal than any of them. The story of Elaine and Susan becoming pals, if only briefly, was a long time coming as Susan has been around a while. I'm assuming this was on the whiteboard in the writer's room as an idea to work in at some point during George's engagement. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah, I agree with so much of this. Like I said, (laughs) that moment in that first scene where Elaine's like, I should be friends with Susan. Like, I do believe all of us in the audience were like, yeah, this never even occurred to us because they kept it separate for so long. And totally agree. I mean, Susan is so much more. That's what I mean by saying, like, I think Susan's too good for this group. Like, she's too logical. She's just she's got her head on her shoulders uh, way more securely than any of these other folks. So... (laughs) She's got her shit together. So totally, except for, I guess, being with George. Um, That's her one fault (laughs) and blind spot. But anyway, I think, yeah, there's an element of like, "Mm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I don't need to be in this group. She is so quote unquote normal. And like, look, I not to get technical, but I just know this from all the nerding out I've done about this show. There was no writer's room like they didn't have like the traditional whiteboard little note card ideas like what they didn't break. I don't think they broke down a season like it was such a different process on Seinfeld because a lot of the writers talk about that when they're doing commentary or the inside look like we were just sent. We were given an idea or we pitched ideas If they liked it, Jerry and Larry, they sent us off to write it by ourselves and then we turn it back into them. And then maybe 50% of it comes out the same, but while the rest of it is rewritten by Jerry and Larry. The only reason I think this might not have been in the plan to work in at some point, like you say, Greg, is because Dave Mandel talks about how this world's colliding thing was purely based on something that he and his friends went through in college. There was a girl who started dating one of the friends, and it became hard for him, especially too when she started using the terminology, like the vault thing. Like he's like, during the commentary, he says this exact thing happened. All of a sudden, this girl's in in our group. And she's using this terminology that we came up with years earlier. And it just sounded odd coming from her and a little bit like, "Mm, this is inappropriate. (laughs) So I don't know, I think I could be wrong. But I think this was just something that Dave Mandel pitched. This was his first episode he wrote. But to your point, I think it totally makes sense that this should have been in their minds from the get-go. Like Elaine is the only female friend in this friend group. Now another one is joining the group by marriage. So it's like a friend-in-law thing. Uh, But no, I really, I think from the gist of what I got from all of the background stuff, behind the scenes stuff, it was just, no, Dave Mandel had this idea and they just went with it. Next in Greg's sack are his favorite scenes and Elaine moments. 
He says, I love the opening scene where Elaine comes in and Jerry asks who she'd think would win in a fight between him and George. And without hesitation, Elaine backs up George. And her reasoning that he would fight dirty, he immediately agrees with. Even the visual of this, you can totally see George would fight this way. It's a quick little throw in that I think starts off this rare Elaine George joint storyline well. Yes, uh, like I said, it's <laughs> it's not the most like she's supporting him, but she's supporting him because he would fight dirty. It's great. It's it's a very Benestanza thing to happen. Next, Greg says Elaine and Susan should be friends. Exclamation point. They're both successful career women from East Coast well-off families. They'd somewhat have a lot in common, I would think. Even if Elaine is, as Kramer so eloquently puts it, a man's woman. I agree. I, I totally agree, which is why I think I just wish we got a little bit more of this friendship. I completely support the ending of this episode, but mm, Elaine and Susan together, uh, I just feel like it would have been, there would have been a lot to... To that, a lot to mine there. Greg goes on to say, the best scene is when George walks into the diner and the booth is full with Susan now replacing him as the fourth in this group. The way George comes in and says, one, two, three, four, and Jerry's face looking up at him. And then George just walks away. And then the follow-up call back to George alone at Reggie's diner. All of this was so well done. Completely agree. Completely agree. <laughs> and it's interesting because I, I can't remember if it was a commentary or notes about nothing. It was mentioned that they tried to write in that George does pull up a chair. He keeps getting bumped. It's just it's like it would be the visual of what this world colliding means. Like he keeps getting collided with being on the end of this booth, sort of on the outskirts of the friendship. So which I think could have been really funny as well. But I completely think the way they ended up doing it was also just as perfect. Next, Greg says, I love the face Elaine makes when Susan basically tells her and Jerry to shut up in the movie. Susan is totally in the right here, but it's also kind of like, how dare she? Oh, it's both fantastic. I love the would you two please? And then the, oh my God, like it's, oh, it's just so great. And it's like the two against one, right? Like these two idiots who are friends, this is normal for them. And then they've got this outsider. So I think maybe also I just thought of this. <laughs> this is their taste of what this world's colliding might mean. Like, OK, now we're going to have this total wet blanket who doesn't get us in this group. <laughs> so I loved I loved and you could totally tell Jerry's about to laugh in that as well with the mouth full of popcorn. It's fantastic. All right. Next in the sack, I find Greg's scene swap idea. He says, I wouldn't necessarily swap anything out, but the Elaine Susan George story is so much better than anything related to the pool guy or Kramer's phone number. I just would have wanted more of it. They could have gotten way more out of an Elaine Susan friendship, but I really only remember it really being this one time. George getting upset about it could have been a multi-episode arc. Completely agree, Greg. Completely agree. Yeah, this is this is all we see of the Elaine and Susan friendship. But I'll get more into my thoughts about that in a little bit. And finally are Greg's extra thoughts. He says, I really like the visual of Newman doing the cannonball into the pool. It's so ridiculous that a grown man would do this at a gym pool, but it cracks me up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's part of the silliness of the show that we love. And I also kind of on the subject of the Danny Hawk story with standing up for yourself and and trying not to be so insulting to certain groups of people. Wayne Knight, when he read that he was going to have to do this, it was his idea to have that sort of one piece swimsuit, kind of like the, it's like the old timey swimsuit for a couple reasons. He said, well, I thought the visual would be really funny. And that way the visual isn't just, oh, it's a fat guy running in a bathing suit and doing a cannonball. And so he was protecting himself, right? Like he didn't want to be the butt of the joke because his body was fat or whatever. And, you know, they do a lot of, I mean, this show This show is so fat phobic and so many jokes about fat people. So, uh, and Newman was the butt of those jokes. But I really admire that Wayne Knight to protect himself was like, hey, this visual would be just as funny. I mean, Newman wearing this ridiculous old timey swimsuit is pretty funny. And that way I'm more comfortable too, so that my body isn't the joke. Good for you, Wayne Knight. I love that. And also, I should mention, when he's giving this interview, he has dropped like 150 pounds in the interview. He's like very, very slim. 
Next, Greg says, did you happen to notice when Kramer is doing the movie phone announcements, he has all his pasta sculptures on display behind him? That was so funny to see. Oh, totally. I loved seeing that. And I want to say, I feel like the... It's like the wagon wheel pasta. I feel like that's Elaine. It's like all circles. <laughs> I'm like, I feel like that's Elaine in her curly hair. The other ones, I couldn't really tell who was who. I was looking for the ravioli one of George, but I didn't see it. And finally, Greg says, why does Ramon refer to himself as a pool boy? Dude, you're 40. Also, do you talk about anything other than pools? Weirdo. Well, it's interesting you say weirdo because they made that shift from that Latino accent guy to just a weirdo. <laughs> That's what they said. They're like, well, we didn't have the other guy, you know, doing the accent, but we just wanted him to be a weird guy that Jerry's just turned off by. Uh, yeah. And I think maybe that's his weirdness is just like, can you, yeah. Why is it all about pools? <laughs> and yeah, calling yourself a pool boy, there's like so many connotations to it, right? Like the the sexy pool boy for the desperate housewife and all that bullshit. But that's what they chose to say. Thank you so much, Greg, for contributing your thoughts this week. Greg did let me know he's still suffering from the flu. My goodness, get your flu shots, everyone. It is a rough one this season. My, my daughter just got her flu shot and her COVID shot <laughs> at the same time. And this poor girl did not feel well for a full day. I had to keep her from school yesterday. She was just burning up and her whole body ached. And I was like, probably shouldn't have done that. But hey. I don't mind taking care of my firstborn. She's growing up very fast. So pampering her, it's um, it's one of the pleasures of my life. <laughs> Thanks again, Greg. And now it's time to close Greg's sack lunch. All right, moving on to my favorite Elaine moments. It's got to be her escape. Bye, Jerry. <laughs> when she abandons Jerry after Ramon comes in. It's like when Elaine's really enjoying herself at the expense of especially Jerry, I was going to say any of the idiots, but uh, especially Jerry, there's just nothing better. A close second would be when she slaps her head. Of course, Susan. I just love that. I just that little slap on the head. <laughs> it might be weird, <laughs> but I like it. And my final notes for the episode, the premise of Elaine and Susan becoming friends Genius. Fantastic. Such a natural thing to come about in this group of friends. And I wish we got some more Susan and Elaine scenes and perhaps some with George as well. I feel like a scene where George is there, like with the two of them trying to sabotage it, like maybe bad mouthing Elaine or bad mouthing Susan in front of the other. That could have been really fun. But I would still have it end the same way. I absolutely love how Susan is like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> Now, in order to get more of the Elaine Susan magic, I probably would have swapped out some of that Ramon stuff. I, I love the Kramer movie phone plot. I love George's worlds colliding. But I do think the Ramon thing just didn't have enough to it to like warrant the time allotted or even the title of the episode. I think this episode should have been called Worlds Colliding <laughs> or the Collision of the Worlds. I don't know. But like the pool boy stuff or pool guy stuff is just it's just not compelling. Uh, maybe if it was a Latino person with the accent, it would have been better. I don't know. But anyway, it seemed like that whole thing had to be rewritten and the performance was rethought. And it just, I don't know, just didn't have a lot of teeth for me. Not enough comedic teeth, which are really funny looking teeth. And I think that's all I can say about the pool guy. Please be sure to follow Hot and Heavy on social media. On Instagram, we are at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok at Elaine Bennis Podcast. And if you'd like to email me any thoughts, please do at Elaine Podcast at gmail.com. And make sure you do follow because I'm going to post that screenshot I was talking about <laughs> with the Dossier Ramon. Love it. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next time.